Um, so I'm here to speak about how demographic growth, uh, so the increase of the world population, has changed the social contract, has changed our habits, and has changed the role of museums and the arts uh, thereby. Um, so the first time, uh, or the moment when world population reached a milestone, the milestone of one billion people, was around 1800. People were shocked. <laughs> There's a certain Mr. Robert Malthus, who's oftentimes still quoted with his doom and gloom um, uh, uh, prophecies uh, and analyses, um, and he said that this, uh, this growth would bring the end of mankind. Um, well, in 1975, we reached 4 billion. The world has still not come to an end. On the contrary, uh, life expectancy has grown tremendously. Um, uh, people, bigger swaths of people uh, are in the middle classes. And in 2025, just imagine that, we're going to be 8 billion on this planet. It's a bit scary. But what happened during that demographic pressure is a change of society, uh, a change of how we interact with one another and of how we define society. So, Richard Sennett, uh, who is now professor at the London School of Economics, wrote a book uh, called The Fall of Public Man, where he analyzed what happened in London and in Paris uh, at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, due to that demographic pressure. And it's really fascinating. So what happened was that people um, could no more deal in the same way with foreigners as they used to in a less populated world. So when you went to a town and you wanted to meet someone, you couldn't just directly go to that person. You needed an intermediary uh, who knew both parties. That's one. Another one is that the notion of privacy, the way we know it now, with gated communities, more or less started then. And when you think, I don't know, some of you may have gone to, to uh, London, uh, in Belgravia and Westminster, there are these squares that have in the middle a garden, and only those who are living around have the key to go into the garden. It's no more a public space. It's taken away from the public realm. Um, there, is, there are many, many uh, uh, other... Uh, 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 aspects in urbanism as well. So uh, where people traditionally lived um, uh, in a city, uh, all social classes combined in one block of flats, uh, in one quadrangle, if you will, um, people got segregated. So the poor people in London, for instance, moved to the East End. Uh, the rich people went further west. Um, and society was fragmented um, socially, very, very fragmented. But then came the saving grace, which is a mixed blessing as everything uh, is in the development of societies, which is the notion of the nation state, so that you are proud to belong to a unit that is much bigger than you, independent of your social status, you become a patriot, um, and uh, you're no more coaxed by some nutty duke to go to war, um, you go as a patriot to war and fight for your country. Now, the stage for these nation states was set, um, often, uh, obviously, in, in increments, but uh, there are two important dates for that. One is the American Revolution, which started in 1775, and the other one is the French Revolution, which uh, uh, is dated uh, 1789. And in those contexts, um, there was a kind of legislation for every citizen. Um, of France, of the United States. There were civic rights defined for every citizen. The problem in the uh, American idea of creating a nation state that normally is based on the idea of homogeneity, ethnic homogeneity and um, cultural homogeneity, um, was a little bit skewed, as we all know. Uh, one of the uh, um, the original sins of American history is slavery, so that homogeneity did not exist, and the country struggles still with this. Um, there was also uh, the um, decimation of the native population, um, and uh, America is an immigration country, 
So homogeneity is not a given as it would be in European uh, uh, countries. Um, and now I'm coming to the arts, because you probably waited when do the arts show their face. Um, so just one year after the um, American Revolution uh, started in 1776, the empress of the uh, Austrian, Hungro Austrian Empire, Maria Theresia, uh, and her son Joseph II, made, which is part of enlightenment, uh, uh, thought we have to use our collection to educate those who are in our realm um, and give them an idea of what it means to be all part of one unit, nation state, basically. So they asked an obscure uh, uh, Swiss, uh, Christian von Mechel, uh, to refashion their collection and make it publicly accessible. And what von Mechel did um, completely changed the way art history is written ever since. Um, he presented all the schools by nations. So there was the Dutch school, there was the Flemish school, there was the British school, the French, the Spanish. Italy didn't exist as a notion, uh, as, a, as a country, so there was the Neapolitan school, the Venetian, and so on and so forth. And then he snuck something in, which was the German school. Again, a country that did not exist. There was Prussia, there was Austria. Um, there were all these nutty dukes everywhere that sent some people to America to fight on behalf of uh, the British. Um, and this is the beginning of a way of spinning what national identity means. So think about that. Art historians, this is also the beginning of, of uh, uh, academic art history. Art historians try to define what is the essence of Germanness as you can see it in a painting. Um, and somebody, very deadpan, very serious, said, um, so the French may be elegant and their paintings extremely elegant, but we Germans, we are profound. We are rustic, but we are profound. They are superficial. And you get this in basically every art history writing in the 19th century, um, uh, categorizing people in a very sweeping way and uh, categorizing uh, um, the, the arts in a very, very sweeping way. And nowadays, when you go to museums, uh, you, uh, you find on the label the name of the artist, date of birth, and then you find that this person um, is American or German-born American. Um, there were even kind of ridiculous disputes. Um, is Vincent van Gogh French or is he Dutch? He's Dutch-born, but he spent most of his um, artistic life uh, in France, and the French like to take everybody in. Uh, so for a lot of French, he's actually French. But um, you may laugh about this. Uh, I don't know if you know the name uh, uh, Whistler, a very, very interesting American painter who spent most of his life, actually, in, um, uh, in, in London and who was born in Massachusetts in Lowell, and he didn't think that this was sexy enough, so he said, I have the right to define where I'm born. I was born in St. Petersburg, and that's it. Um, and um, he is always described as American, but there is nothing profoundly American or un-American about him. He just happened to cross the, the Atlantic uh, and uh, be part of a very rarefied uh, group of people uh, uh, in, in England and in, in, in Europe. So, the Nazis pushed it even further. Um, art was stolen uh, from all over Europe as the, uh, uh, the German army, um, the Nazi army, was, was, was invading uh, all the neighbors. And uh, there was a discourse on Rembrandt being actually much more German than Dutch because he had this profoundness that we Germans have and nobody else does. So, um, and then there were others who were considered to be the other, degenerate. Although they may have been German-born, uh, they were not the right artists to really define uh, the German soul. So the sameness and otherness defining both go hand in hand. And of course, uh, uh, it's a very futile enterprise to do that. So our world population in the 1960s had crawled its way up to three point, I don't know how many billion inhabitants. Um, the fights of nation states in World War I and II um, showed that it couldn't continue in that way. Um, and all of a sudden, our world was not just a world of nation states, it was a world, it became a world 
of zones of influence. It was the Western world versus the communist bloc, and then there was a third world um, uh, with countries that hadn't uh, economically uh, uh, developed sufficiently, such as India, China, uh, uh, and uh, countries from uh, Latin America, Brazil. Um, at the same time, uh, the United Nations um, were founded, um, and there was an organization uh, that uh, is very dear to my heart, although they are utterly naive and extremely, uh, um, uh, extremely optimistic, but it's better that than extremely pass pessimistic and, um, yeah, and I don't know what the, the equivalent of naive and negative is. Uh, so they started to define a worldwide list of heritage of humanity. So on that list you have the Statue of Liberty, uh, you have the Cathedral uh, of Chartres in France, you have Mayan sites in Mexico, you have the historic city of Timbuktu in Mali, um, places in India, in Rajasthan, in China, in Australia. And what happened very, very slowly uh, since World War II is that we all understand that we have actually a shared heritage. And as our world population is growing and growing and growing, as um, mobility is growing, as um, immigrants are all over the world, uh, this is uh, uh, in terms of, of, of movement uh, of people for economic and other reasons, it has never been uh, uh, to that point on planet Earth. So there is no more other, we just see people who are less fortunate than us. Um, some people would like to cast them as other, but um, uh, it is basically, um, yeah, we see the humanity in what we perceived as the other uh, uh, more easily, or we have that opportunity. Um, America uh, tried to build a national school. The Europeans never looked at it because they were far too much navel-gazing themselves. Um, and what happened after World War II was that the American national art, which was really pushed by uh, the Kennedy administration, for instance, for uh, um, uh, Biennales in Venice and, and elsewhere, it was Jackson Pollock, de Kooning, so abstract expressionism. But it was no more seen as just American, it was seen as representing the Western world. So um, we are slowly, slowly uh, moving uh, uh, away uh, from this um, idea of uh, a static uh, self and a very odd and most likely inferior uh, other. But it's very slow, this movement. So where we are we today? Um, the, uh, the Worcester Art Museum, um, because it all boils down to the Worcester Art Museum, that's why I'm here, um, sees its role uh, in telling the history of our world heritage in a new way. So right now, we are thinking about redistributing our galleries, um, and we will not make a point of defining what separates us, but actually accentuating what unifies us, what unites us, um, and make sure that we are all taking care of that shared heritage of art from all over the world. Um, anecdotally, something that I'm extremely proud of, uh, we have been organizing um, naturalization ceremonies uh, in our Renaissance court. Um, the first one took place in January of last year, and we just had the second one, uh, which was uh, at the beginning of this month, April. Um, and there were 50 new Americans coming from all over the world, something like 30 countries from Argentina to Zambia, and um, the keynote speaker said to them, um, I hope when you're coming, you are bringing your cultural suitcases along and you're opening those suitcases and enrich America as previous generations have always done. Um, the federal judge who officiated said, you are standing here in a place uh, where the culture of the entire world is preserved um, and where we um, learn about uh, the creativity of mankind. Now that you're an American citizen, do help us uh, to steward this for future generations. At that same uh, event, the current president of the United States uh, gave a talk, not in person, it comes via video, as in the previous year it was still uh, uh, Obama, and he said something that gave me pause. Um, 
and not in the way you think it gave me pause, because he said, and now you're American and now you have to assimilate. Everybody looked on the ground. Um, but assimilation doesn't mean become a white person. That would be very difficult if you're from Zambia. Um, uh, it also doesn't mean um, uh, start to eat hamburgers, because it's not very healthy. Um, but it could mean uh, that uh, we are all um, s sticking by certain foundational rules of this country, uh, which is the Constitution, uh, and uh, which is a social contract. Um, so it is not as negative as it was perceived uh, in that meeting by most of us who were there. Let me conclude um, uh, with this demographic growth. It is indeed scary that in 2025 we're going to be 8 um, billion people on this planet. Uh, it has huge um, implications on the environment, we're seeing this. Um, so all the more do we need to work together to steward this planet and to steward our heritage, because that is also what connects us. Um, and then there is a, just a very good little piece of information. Um, although in the 20th century, uh, we grew by 400%, kind of unimaginable. Um, the peak uh, of growth uh, is over. We are currently, um, in terms of world growth, at 1%. Um, so it's, it's, it's a line that goes down. And this is in parts related uh, to um, the middle classification of the world. Um, and to a new economic system that is settling in, which again will change the social contract. And I am optimistic enough to think that this social contract uh, will be a worldwide one, that the UN will not be as toothless as it currently is. Um, there is the United States of Europe that is forced to constitute itself. Um, there are many tensions uh, that make it extremely necessary that we all work together to steward the future of this planet and the future of mankind. Thank you.